In this video, I'd like to talk a little about a medieval writer named Marie de France. This video is intended to supplement, but not replace your reading. So make sure to read the selections from the Norton Anthology of Literature by Women in Volume 1 that are listed here and on the modules page. So you'll want to start with the Literature of the Middle Ages and Renaissance essay, which will provide some useful historical context, and then read the biographical note about Marie de France and her poem, Eonet. You can watch this video first and then read these materials and watch a second video that will dive into Eonek in a bit more depth, um, or you can stop now and take a look at this material before continuing. That's up to you. In reading the introductory material in our book on the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, you'll learn some important context for what is a pretty vast stretch of time. It may seem odd to you that we're only discussing a few writers from both eras, but that's because there are so few known women writing literature in the period, particularly um, in the Middle Ages. And this brings to mind something said by Virginia Woolf, a 20th century writer who we'll study later in the semester. She wrote that I would venture to guess that Anon, who wrote so many poems without signing them, was often a woman. Well, surely there are unsigned writings from this period, and perhaps literature attached to male pseudonyms that were produced by women, but we may never know how many. We're also, of course, dependent upon what literature is preserved throughout history, and this can be hit or miss for either gender. Uh, but there is also the distinct possibility that since women's writing was not as valued as men's writing, that there are works that simply weren't preserved. Um, that no longer exist. Because as you'll read about in this introduction, women's roles were quite circumscribed with very little agency and independence allotted to them. So even if there was women's writing that we no longer have access to, they still would have been few and far between compared to men writing at the time. Only well-born women, and men for that matter, were literate. And when it came to writing, the expectation for most women would have been that maybe they wrote letters or copied or translated uh, works by men, maybe from Latin or French to English. Uh, there might be some occasional religious devotional writing, uh, but even there, women had to step carefully. Um, that too could be seen as a man's world. And yet, as we'll see later in the module with Julian of Norwich, a religious life could be one of refuge. Allotting time and space to pursue your own interests provided they were holy. For many medieval men and women, the church was a place not just of faith but intellect, a place of contemplation, study, and community. Although Julian of Norwich in some ways lived an isolated life as an anchoress, she was also sought far and wide for her advice, achieving a position of power and making for herself a life of meaning. She was the exception, not the rule, however as is a writer like Marie de France, of whom we know very little. She too came to writing from a well-born and educated background, and this small class of women of their access to education owes in large part to a shift from more tribal cultures and oral society to a hierarchical society in Europe, built on a feudal system that allotted the upper class privileges that the lower classes could hardly dream of, including literacy. Nonetheless, even well-off women faced adversity in making their names known, establishing lives outside of simply being married off to produce a family line. Um, Marie de France alludes to such a limited role of women in her poem, Eonetic. So let's turn now to the mysterious Marie de France. Marie de France is one of the first recorded female authors in Europe, and yet her identity is a mystery. All we know about her identity for sure is a statement that she makes in an epilogue to one of her works, uh, The Fables. She says, Marie is my name and I am from France. And well, it's quite possible that Marie itself could be a pseudonym, so we might not even know that much. What we do know is that Marie was born around 1170 in Normandy, France, and at some point moved to England, where she published in the Anglo-Norman dialect of French that was spoken in England. Scholars have posited that she may have been named Mary and was the illegitimate daughter of Geoffrey, Duke of Normandy, which would have made her sister to King Henry II, and that she held a position of power and influence as an abbess of Shaftesbury. But 
we don't know. There are a few other possibilities uh, as far as identities go that have been posited over the years, but nothing is certain. We do know she was fluent in Latin, French, and English based upon her writing. She was well read, seeing as how her stories uh, draw upon the genre of courtly love and romance, as well as mythology. While the genre of romance then is not the same as what we refer to as romance today, there are certainly some similarities. A romance didn't have to involve love, it could be just an adventurous quest, but these two things were often combined, particularly in what we call courtly love. So let's take a quick look at what I mean when I say courtly love. We're so accustomed now to love stories and just the concept of love and romance in general that it's probably hard to imagine a time when that wasn't part of our culture, our literature, our entertainment. But the concept of courtly love that emerged in the Middle Ages was huge, foundational in the English-speaking world's uh, concept of love, not just in literature, but perhaps in life. Uh, the, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary offers a pretty accurate definition here to get us started. Uh, they describe it as a highly conventionalized medieval tradition of love between a knight and a married noblewoman. And this was a love uh, of the knight for his lady that was regarded as an ennobling passion, and the relationship was typically unconsummated. Michael Delahoyd, an English professor at Washington State University, expands upon this, and he posits that this focus on love and romantic passion was new in the Middle Ages. He says that there was previously no literary nor social framework for it in the Christian world before the end of the 11th century. And this is when we see uh, Marie de France writing. The Western tradition, Delahoy tells us, had no room for the expression of love. There's none in Beowulf or the Song of Roland. Religious tradition speaks of love, but that's agape, platonic, Christian love of all humankind. In classical literature, we witness what's called love, but as exemplified well by the case of Dido for Aeneas, the passion is often described in fiery terms and reads like eros, lust. Now, Delahoyd also notes how contrary this focus on love in medieval literature, and sometimes the accompanying lust, uh, how contrary it was to the religious culture of the period in which the church played a dominant role. So it goes on to point out how courtly love is set up in opposition to medieval marriage, or maybe as a necessary corollary to it. He says that nobles in feudal society married not for love, but for real estate and heirs. It's been said that in the Middle Ages, you married a thief and got a wife thrown in with the bargain. Idealized love goes against the utilitarian economics of marriage, and passion was forbidden by the church. So until the courtly version came along, love was duty and love was sinful. Thus, courtly love emerged and remained outside of marriage. And so many stories of courtly love involved a knight falling for a married woman, who he could love from afar. Sometimes an affair might be pursued, but that often ended tragically, though we like tragic love stories, don't we? Now, in the real world of courts and kings, courtly courtly love was a thing, too. I mean, it wasn't uncommon for women in power to have men who courted them, poets who they patronized to write odes to them, and I provided a reading in this module to give you some more context about this if you're interested. Uh, it describes how, in some ways, courtly love empowered women, and in other ways it only further objectified them. Now, interestingly, many of Marie de France's stories portray marriage as something that traps a person, usually the woman, and real love lies outside of marriage, a marriage that for many well-born women was little more than a business transaction in which they were the currency, married off by their fathers to whatever man made the best deal. Marie's lays are full of tropes of courtly romance and some adulterous affairs are framed as romantic, and others are ill-intentioned and disastrous, such as in Biscrobe, another poem in our textbook, in which a woman, upon discovering her husband, transforms into a wolf occasionally, traps him in his wolf form, passes him off for dead, and marries her lover. I won't spoil the story, in case you decide to read it, it's pretty great, uh, but she is not the hero of the story. 
It's actually quite an interesting poem. The real romance of that lay might be interpreted as between Biscorbe, the werewolf-like man, and a king who saves him. So check it out. At any rate, while Marie de France was not the first to write stories of knights and love affairs, she did so in her own way, allotting her female characters far more prominent and active roles than was usually found in chivalric literature of the period, where women were often simply passive objects or side characters. Now, I mentioned the word lay earlier. Lays are short romances, that is, tales of courtly love and adventure, that were popular in this period, and a lay in particular was a poetic and musical form. Uh, popular in northern France, long poems with stanzas of 6 to 16 lines, 4 to 8 syllables per line. Marie worked with 8 syllables, and uh, the translation that we're reading in our textbook uh, tries to keep that rhythm going. Now, in the prologue to her collection of these 12 different lays, uh, one of which is a eunuch, Marie says that she was initially looking for a work, a creative work in Latin or French to translate, and she couldn't find anything good. So she tells us she decided to write down some of the musical lays, the oral stories that she had heard, and it's her own spin on it. And she would not be the first to do so. That's a lot of what medieval literature consists of. This idea that you might have heard the story before, uh, but not the way I've told it. Her lays were quite popular. We know they were translated into Middle English and Old Norse, and they were reworked by other authors in centuries to come. Now, I love that in her prologue, which you can see here at the top of the, uh, the slide, that she comes out and establishes right from the get-go that she has the right to tell her stories. She says that to whom God gives intelligence and the great gift of eloquence shouldn't hide or silence talent, but show it and be valiant. She recognizes her own gift, and that's not a small thing. She cuts off anyone from questioning her ability to write by suggesting that it's a God-given gift and therefore a duty. Her stories aren't overly religious, though. They do have religious elements, as we see in Eunuch, but, I mean, these lays are packed with juicy stuff, even if they're told perhaps a little more tamely than our current standards. But there's love, sex, adultery, revenge, the supernatural, war. She writes about Arthurian knights, werewolves, uh, curses, fairy lovers, imprisoned wives, murder plots, oh, and a lot more. She draws upon traditions of folklore, mythology, and courtly romance to craft stories that would have appealed at the time to real people's interests and desires. They were entertaining. So let's take a look at one of those stories, a lay called Eonek, which you can find in our Norton textbook on page 25. I'd like you to go ahead and read that, and then proceed to the next video further down on this module page.